The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to today's WCET webcast, Using Behavioral Analytics to Support Student Retention. As we move through, if you have any questions, please enter them into the question box. And the webcast is being recorded. We will send you a link and also make it available with captions on the WCET website. You can download the PowerPoint presentation by clicking the handout pane and downloading a copy of the PDF. Also, we tend to have a pretty active Twitter back channel. If you'd like to follow along, the hashtag is WCET webcast, and you can also post questions there. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. We have a lot of content to get through today. We'll start with brief introductions of the speakers, talk about retention at Utica College, discuss retention and support services, move into behavior analytics. We'll get to your Q&A at that time, and then we'll uh, do a summary and conclusion. Again, as you have questions, please enter them into the question box, and we'll be sure to monitor that. If we need to step in and ask a presenter a question for clarification, we will do <coughs> that. Otherwise, we will hold questions until the Q&A portion. We have a wonderful moderator today. Kevin, Kelvin Bentley is the Assistant Vice President for Digital Learning and Innovation in the Division of Research and Strategic Innovation at the University of West Florida. And that position will go into effect on April 30th. So we have him while he's in transition as we speak and, and moving in and settling in. So we're happy to have Kelvin join us today. So I'll let Kevin do a brief intro and then he will introduce our panelists today. Kelvin. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I've always enjoyed um, attending WCT uh, webinars, and today's topic on behavioral analytics uh, was very interesting to me. So uh, just thank you all for, for joining us. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of um, introducing today's uh, presenters. Uh, first, uh, Stephanie Tassales from uh, uh, from Wiley Educational Services, and she serves as the Senior Director of Professional Services for Wiley Educational Services. And uh, also, um, I'd like to introduce Polly Smith, who serves as the Associate Provost for Online Learning and the uh, Vice President for Online and Extended Studies at Utica College. So I will uh, pass off the, uh, the mic uh, to our presenters today. Uh, good afternoon. Um, this is Polly Smith, and as Kelvin so kindly said, I'm from Utica College, and I'm happy to uh, speak with all of you this afternoon. Um, just want to give a quick, quick, I give you a quick idea of what my background is. So um, I've been working at Utica College for about 15 years, and served as um, department chair of sociology, and then also uh, moved our uh, master's. Of liberal studies program from the ground format to an online format and I've been teaching online for approximately um, 14 years. Um, I've been serving as the associate provost uh, for online learning for about six years and, and, and have been serving in the vice president role for I think three. So um, what I'd like to talk to you about is how we've, how we've improved retention at the college and so I'd like to start with um, a definition of I guess I'm going to start with, sorry about that, folks. So, so Utica College is, has been building a strategic portfolio in terms of its online offerings for some time. Um, we have partnered with Wiley Education Services since 2004 and currently offer 14 degrees uh, fully online and have 27 distinct specializations and tracks. We have um, 12 online certificate programs and our, our programs range um, from criminal justice to health, allied health and cybersecurity. Um, Data science is one of our more recent. And so um, as a nonprofit institution with, uh, we are, you know, a fairly small school with, with just over 5,000 students. And, and working with Wiley has helped us to place ourselves solidly in the market in an environment where a lot of schools our size are struggling. And one of, the, one of the names of the game today is, of course, retention rates, graduation rates. When we send out admissions packages to our students, we have to, we have to note those things. And um, when, when folks talk with us about our, 
online offerings, they say, well, how do you do it? You know, your retention must be, retention we hear is awful in the online space. And so I wanna talk a little bit about um, retention in our online programs and how we've worked with um, Wiley Education Services to improve retention in that space. So I mentioned that um, I've been working with the Wiley Partnership for about um, five years now. And in those five years, we've been able to We've been able to improve retention from what I think is what most schools experience quite a, a challenge to something that we're proud of and actually outpaces the retention um, retention rates in our ground offerings. So I think I'd like to start with how we calculate retention for the purposes of this um, particular um, conversation. So uh, different institutions have different ideas of what retention is and how to calculate it. So for the sake of this presentation, we're going to talk about term to term retention. So for, and, and this is different than, this is online retention at the school. We do calculate retention for our ground programs using that first time freshman cohort and then tracking them from the time of entry to, to graduation. But in the online space, because we have three starts a year, so we have a technically a fall cohort, a spring cohort and a summer cohort, we find that um, monitoring retention from term to term. So from one, uh, from one fall to the spring and then from um, the spring to the summer and then again summer to fall is most effective. It helps us to keep our eye on that needle um, each and every day. So when we're talking about retention, when you're seeing the scores, what we're looking at is term to term retention. So as you can see, if you look at the retention rates from 2013 to 2017, you can see that they've that they've been steadily increasing. And when I look at the especially the fall retention, so that's from summer to fall, is a, is, that's the term to term that we're talking about. We're now steadily, you know, over that 90% mark. So when I talk to other folks about retention, I say, well, when, have, when are you done? So when are you done looking at retention rates? And they say, well, 82% 82, 82 is our benchmark. And when they're talking about that 82%, they're talking about cohort retention. And I can tell you that these term to term um, retention rates that you're looking at on the, sli on the slide, um, they do translate into, for most of those programs, most of these programs into um, about 89, 87 to 89%. Now we have a couple of programs that are still struggling a little bit, but overall uh, we're very pleased with um, the retention rates, even the cohort retention rates in the online space. So if we look, take a look at the program um, retention rates on the next slide, um, we can see, we, we pulled out a couple of programs. So BS Cyber, um, and understand that BS Cyber is a degree completion program, which means we're admitting students who already have had some college success. So they are students that are coming in with an associate's degree or its equivalent. Um, the, the term to term retention for that program is, is high. Uh, and when we look at, and has increased, so 79% to 90%. And the same similar results are seen in the RN to BSN program. Um, the TDPT, program, you look at that 94% that we're achieving now and you think, wow, that is fantastic. But we have to consider anytime we're looking at programmatic retention, all aspects of the program. So when I look at um, BS Cyber or RN to BSN, those are again, um, degree completion programs. So that's, that's two years. When we look at TDPT, we're talking a shorter time frame because um, that program is only 18 credits. So you're retaining students and it looks like wow, everybody should be doing what we're doing in TDPT, but we have to realize that's across 18 credits rather than 30. So lots of factors to consider when tracking um, retention trends. The MS HCA is a traditional master's program. Again, that 30 credits, and it shows um, increasing success in terms of retention. So lots of times when I'm talking about this with the folks at Wiley, I say, well, what can we do to hit 100%? And I always think, why are you asking that question? Because 100% retention, well, all of you are educators in one way, shape, or form, or contribute to the educational experience. 100% would almost communicate that you know there's something wrong with your standards, because as everyone knows, not every student is going to make it from the beginning of the program to the end. So when we look at retention and trying to move the needle, again, when it goes above 90 at this term-to-term -term retention, we think we're doing a great job. So, so folks, um, we'll say, well, wait a minute, retention rates are, are percentage-based. So if we look at enrollment trends, we'll give you an idea of how many students we're talking about. So the next slide talks about, um, shows you, you know, over, over the course of that same four-year period, what the enrollments have looked like. So not only have we increased retention, but we've increased retention with increasing enrollments. 
So we really have a finger on our population. Um, we're targeting uh, this, the, the being able to increase retention at the same time as you're increasing your enrollments indicates that, you know, addresses that piece, that standard piece. So do you have any standards? Well, we do have some admission standards. We're able to increase our population and we're able to maintain our retention rates and actually have seen them increase over the four year period. So, so have we been successful? I think that's probably how come I'm talking to you is because we have been successful, but I can also talk to you a little bit about how we got from where we started in 2013 to where we are today. Um, and I can tell you that if you were to look at the data for 2018, it's, it's about on par. So we're not seeing a whole lot of movement in terms of, um, we're seeing increasing enrollments, but we're not seeing those retention rates go much over that, uh, you know, 92, 94% is about where we're, where we're holding on. So, um, but I wanna talk a little bit about not only how we got there, but what it looked like in 2013. So before we really started looking at online retention um, rates, and the state of our online programs before we realized as a small institution that, wait a minute, we're putting all of this time and effort into creating quality programs, but we're, and it costs a lot to bring these students in, but we're not keeping them. So what are we gonna do about that? Uh, when we realized it was a problem, we took a look at our system and how we manage and um, we're running the online pieces of the school. And we realized that we lacked a, a centralized administrator. So there was nobody managing the portfolio of online programs as a whole. So there was no one that the online program directors, the folks charged with running those programs, there was no one that they could talk to. And not only that, but they weren't talking to one another. So there were difficulties um, not identifying and resolving concerns regarding not only enrollments and what to do as enrollments were going up, but um, there was no attention paid to retention for online programs specifically. So, so folks would sit in school meetings and in um, board meetings and you know, institutional town halls and listen to you know, enrollments and retention for the ground campus. And so the college decided, well, if we want to really take this diversified revenue stream that we're using to um, keep our college afloat and be able to have some capital projects in place and those types of things, then we better start, start taking a look at um, retention. We better start taking a look at the quality of the programs. And so what we decided to do is we um, created the position that I ended up taking of Associate Provost for Online Learning. We already had that Vice President for Online and Extended Studies, and that person was in charge of the partnerships that we have. But the academic piece, that academic uh, commonplace for, for the educators and the faculty to, to access and to talk about what was going on with their students, which were not you know, prime time conversations at the college was, was really, really important when it came to retention and, and taking a look at what needed to be done. Um, the second place we looked was the quality of our courses. And we said, you know, guys, it's really, really great that you've all jumped in and joined the efforts to move um, courses and content online. But the days where you can take your ground course and put it online and then kind of figure out that that doesn't really work and you need, you need to actually figure out how to teach online, those days are over and we're gonna provide you with some, um, some assistance. So um, we'll get to what we did in a few minutes, but we decided that faculty weren't going to um, create, create courses just any way they wanted in any format, in any, you know, just, just throwing paint at the wall and saying, okay, so that my ground content looks like this, I'm gonna upload that to an online course shell and the students are gonna love it. So. We, we took a look at that and, and made some changes. Um, the other piece was the in-house uh, student support. So we had um, what may, may have been uh, gently called a success coach in place in-house for the online program. So each program had someone who would help students, the online students navigate through our, our administrative offices and you know, get them registered in financial aid and all that kind of stuff. But they weren't really trained to do that. So these were folks who were also doing something else and who um, you know, really didn't know a whole lot about online education, just like everybody else at the college. And they didn't really know a whole lot about um, how to interface or interact with online students, how often, how much, using what type of media. And so we decided, so, so using that model, we, we, we looked at that and we said, you know, we wouldn't hire faculty to teach courses. I wouldn't hire a mathematician to teach my English course. Now it could be that the mathematician could learn how to teach the English course and be really good at it, or it could be 
that the mathematician is really a mathematician. <laughs> so we had to have those conversations. And again, you know, all of this was being filtered through um, this academic uh, position that we had created. And then finally, we, we, we took a look at one other piece and we said, you know, faculty want to hear from faculty more than they want to hear from anybody else. So even though we had created an academic administrative position to kind of kind of manage all of the online programs, uh, we, what we really needed was for the online programs to be talking to one another. We needed them to be able to identify with their peers across campus because what was happening is, you know, the, the director of our um, MS and HCA and the director of the r and BSN and the director of the, you know, fraud crime management program, they were all experiencing the same things and all of them spinning their wheels to try to figure out how to address the problems that they were having. But when we started, so we decided that it might be more productive to bring all those folks um, into the same room and let them together uh, put their thoughts, their minds, their concerns into one um, great big picture and then try to come up with solutions and to try to help them to uh, create a community of online, of online learning, of online teaching, and to help them um, avoid feeling alienated. So I, I, I can't emphasize enough that um, in 2013, online education was kind of like graduate education was for the college in 2000. It was seen as almost a threat to, um, to what was happening on the ground. So when I look at how we changed, so one of the things that we did was we put into place again the associate provost for online learning. Then we combined the position of associate provost for online learning with the vice president for online extended studies, which is which is awkward for me because I report both to the provost and to the president, but it made that voice for the online space one voice instead of two. So it wasn't one operational person saying, and I hate to say this, but enroll, 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 more students, more money, more students, more money. And another person saying, wait a minute, we need quality in the online space. We need some form of consistency, quality control. You know, we need some sort of, um, we, need, we need to make sure that we're delivering high quality education because we're, we're a college. But that's, that's what we do. That's what our mission says we do. Um, we put in place online program directors meetings. And so, uh, those directors not only got together when they had a problem, but got together on a regular basis and not only uh, not only to address the problems that they were seeing or the, the difficulties that they were having, but also to come up with new and innovative things that they wanted to do, um, resources that they would like to have, trainings that they'd like their faculty to attend. And so to really talk about the same things that the ground faculty were talking about. And then we established a communication plan at the same time that we decided to take on um, a, uh, to expand our partnership with Wiley to include the full range of academic support services. When we made that decision, as you can imagine, it wasn't wasn't super popular, <laughs> um, but we have found that it was the key to our success. We and we not only created that partnership at the C-suite level at the top, the president's, the provost cabinet, but we went down to the program directors, to our SFS folks, to our marketing folks, to um, the registrar's office, and we found the people on our Wiley team that were doing those things, and we hooked them up with the people, the people at Utica College. So the Utica College, the Wiley folks, we kind of created a, it was you know an org chart of sorts at first, and we said, you guys need to talk for a half hour to an hour every week, talk to each other, figure out, how we're going to do what we need to do to increase enrollment and increase retention in the online programs. And you would, it was amazing to watch the synergies. It was amazing to see how well the teams worked together once they were allowed to talk to each other. Because it, the online space was this, this almost this monster in the, in the middle of the room that everyone's like, oh, well, that's, that's some shady operation. Um, and, and, you know, we're not allowed to know anything about that. So being transparent and allowing folks to see what was going on not hiding anything, not hiding any information, but letting people work together across the two organizations was, was awesome. On top of that, as if that wasn't super, we took on the Wiley Success Coach model. <clears throat> and the students were, each of our students on, online was assigned to a Wiley Success Coach. And that success coach was linked at the hip with the program director of the program the student was assigned to. And they would, um, they, they went over the success coach plan. Um, they looked at all the touch points, the program directors and the success coaches even today talk each week and sometimes before a start they might talk three, four times a week. 
they work on making sure students are have have access to the schedules get the classes that they need to progress they make sure that if a student has a problem in a course that they get hooked up with their faculty member the success coaches are just wonderful um, and the students will talk about them so we even got to a point where those success coaches we bring students to campus in some programs and the success coaches come and the relationship that exists between that success coach and the students is phenomenal and if that's not super the relationship between the program directors and the success coaches we've had our success our program directors um, go to academic conferences with their success coach to talk about this very issue how did we move the needle in, re on, in retention how are we getting 90 percent term over term retention 87 percent cohort retention in our programs and if you were to ask my program directors how that why that is they would tell you it's because of their relationship with the success coach so um, the success coach model was a win-win um, in, in addition to that, we engaged with the Wiley Instructional Design Team and took a look at the courses in our LMS. We actually shifted from one LMS to another, which was, I don't know if that was a super experience, but, but we did it. But we also came up with Utica College best practices for online teaching and learning. We came up with, we partnered with um, Quality Matters to have a national standard to talk to the faculty about. Again, the faculty don't want to hear from me what I think they should do in their classes, but they will listen to you know, somebody who has done nationally normed research and has statistics and data. Um, they do want the Utica College product to be superior. They do want the student experience to be, um, to be excellent. So, we came up with a template. We came up with a range of activities. We came up with, you know, a way to help to to help the student to understand um, what what to expect, not only from week to week in a given course, but from course to course in a program. Um, and this was this was difficult, but using using um, the information from the instructional design team. We did hire a couple of instructional designers on campus to work with folks who just couldn't manage to work over the phone. I don't know how they expect their students to, to be able to learn co course content in eight weeks online if they can't manage to talk to an instructional designer on the phone. But, you know, that was a bridge we had to cross. And rather than, you have to choose your fight. So rather than fight that fight, we actually decided to, um, to just hire a couple of folks to be on campus for those who needed to do this work face to face. And then finally, we kind of came full circle and um, created a partnership council. So that is the um, top level administrators at both Wiley Education and at Utica College um, created a high level administrative group to review progress quarterly. So we established goals and benchmarks, um, some of those retention based. We talked about you know, what types of technology, new technology has developed over time. So from 2013 forward, and I think Stephanie's gonna talk a little bit about some of that progress. Um, but we talked about how we could use that technology to improve retention and slowly over time that that needle moved and and I, I look at the portfolio of online programs and I think that the retention um, the retention efforts have been very, very successful. So you know how did we get these results? You know in a nutshell, if I were to summarize all of that long-windedness, um, you know the Utica College results were achieved. Um, by taking a student-centered approach. Um, we move to the next slide. You know, we build a relationship with the student from the time they first call and say, hey, I saw your ad, or whether they click on the chat box online and they say, tell me a little bit more about this, this program at Utica College. From that first interaction, we start, we start collecting information um, using the programs and the techniques and the tools that we have access to through Wiley and we really get to know that student and that information that we learn about that student from day one helps us to help them to be successful and to meet their goals. Um, we find the best fit in terms of program selection so we created a portfolio I you know earlier I talked about a strategic portfolio we have a lot of students that call and say I want my degree in cybersecurity and we say, okay, we have that. Let's have a conversation. So talk to us about your goals. Talk to us about what you want to do when you graduate. Talk to me a little bit about what you, what you, um, what you may have, uh, what, you, what you're doing now. What do your parents do? What do your kids do? I mean, what's your life like? So we have those conversations and we build those, those um, relationships to help students determine, is it really a cybersecurity degree that I want? 
or do I want a criminal intelligence analyst degree or do I want to be criminal justice or is what I really want is to get a four year degree in something and actually get my MBA. So, so we're able to have those conversations and develop those relationships to make sure that the students are where they really want to be, not where they thought they wanted to be when they first called. So that helps helps us retain the students because we're we're engaging with them and we're letting them know that that what they do and what they want is important to us too. And we wanna make sure that they get that. Flexibility, you know, there's the whole notion of anytime, anywhere, um, but providing lots and lots of opportunities for engagement anytime and anywhere was also key to this. So, I mean, in the past, I used to talk about, you know, when you do course development, there's three buckets. There's the instructional designer, there's the content experts, faculty member, and then there's the teaching faculty, the person that actually delivers that content to the student. And if we want the student, the faculty experience to be solid, we have to have all, we have to have, you know, each, each of those buckets has to be full. When we talk about student engagement, you know, when we are working with our students, student engagement happens on three levels as well. So there's student to student engagement, which is really important and better be in those courses. There's faculty to student engagement, which comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes, but that too has to be there. And then there's engagement between the student and the content of the course. So flexibility, yes, but lots of engagement and making sure that, you know, if, you, if you're a regulatory person, you've met your time on task and that your student is satisfied, that is, that is a, that's key to, to retaining students. Meeting expectations, the, the ex expectations of online students change on a regular basis. So 10 years ago, if you had asked an online student, do you wanna be a part of a, an organization at the college? They would have said, no, just give me access to my course and let me do my stuff. What I want is your degree. But today, the online student not only wants to be engaged with their faculty member in a way that they did not before, so they want those live sessions, they want videos, they want, you know, they want that type of engagement, whereas in the past they did not, but they also want to be engaged with the college. And so it's finding, it's keeping a finger on that pulse and making sure that you're providing um, that level of, of uh, um, engagement as well with the institution. And that differs by program, so don't, don't mark my words that every, every online student wants that. And how do we do all of this? We listen and we respond to student feedback. So if we ask students for their feedback and they're in course one and they've made a really good point, they can see probably in course three, just give us a little bit of time, these are eight week courses, that something's changed based on what they've said. So that keeps the student committed, it keeps them moving forward and it increases, it increases not only retention but also enrollments because word of mouth about your program is gonna be one of the fastest ways to increase um, enrollment. So the st student-centered approach, that's how we achieved our results. And we took that all the way through all of the, the relationships and the interactions from student financial services to the registrar's office to the success coach as they engage with all of the folks that they engage with on campus, our faculty, our instructional designers, everybody has to be student-centered. So when we have a conversation, we ask, what does this mean for the student? And we talk about it from that perspective. On top of that, there were relationships that need to be formed um, between Wiley Education Services and Utica College. So this notion of a true partnership um, was, was super important. And how did we do that? Well, it was hard at first, but we, we were transparent. If we weren't happy with something that we were, we were doing, we would go back and we'd say, you know what, this just is not working for me. How can we fix it? We didn't play the blame game. Um, we don't play the blame game and we don't look backwards. So if something happens, instead of saying, well, how in the world did that happen? That's your fault. What we say is, okay, this has happened. How do we fix it and make sure it doesn't impact the students? And then moving forward, how are we gonna prevent that from happening again? And that's a very different conversation from, this was your fault, I want you to fix it, I want you to be accountable. It's saying, okay, this has happened, let's go forward from here. So that helped um, tremendously. Um, so we talk about barriers, we talk about opportunities, we talk about, responding to a changing environment. We, we invest on both sides in going to, to um, conferences where folks are talking about the latest and greatest um, you know, innovations in technology. I mean, I went to a conference, I think it was last year where I was able to fly, put this you know, neat little thing on my, um, these neat little glasses on and fly all over the place. And I thought, well, this didn't exist 10 years from now. And it's up, to, it's up to me to bring that information back to the team as a whole, back to my faculty and say, is this good for our students or not? So it was all about it was all about being student centered. It was all about creating partnership. 
but we couldn't do what we do without the type of work that folks like Stephanie at Wiley do. So I'm gonna pass it over to her and let, you let her talk to you about the tools that allow us to, to do this work. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Salas. Um, as you said, or as Polly said, I work with Wiley. Um, I've been part of the team here for 14 years. For those who don't know, um, Wiley acquired a company called Deltac about six years ago, and I was one of the founding members of that team. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, we're going to go ahead and shift now to talking about Wiley's approach to retention and our behavioral analytics platform. Um, as Polly talked about, it really does take a village when it comes to student retention. Um, and we sort of have a three-pronged approach focused on people, process, and technology, and we're going we're gonna to cover it in that order. So um, moving to my next slide, as we talk about people, um, that, that success coach that Polly talked about, that recruiter um, who's helping that student find the right programmatic fit, um, those for, folks actually work for Wiley, but they represent Utica in the marketplace. And the students have no idea sometimes that the success coaches actually work for Wiley, but it's really important to us to have a focus on talent selection. While we continue to invest in technology and innovation, people have always been our best resource. So we put a lot of time into the talent selection process. Um, for our student-facing colleagues, the interview process is, is what you see here. It's lengthy, five to seven interviews, a mix of over the phone and in person, because most of the interaction with these students happens over the phone. We want to make sure we have folks who can connect and engage with people over the phone. Uh, we do what we call a ride-along, where um, a student-facing employee will sit with a prospective employee um, and show them what the job is like firsthand. Um, we do a third-party background check, um, a third-party evaluation, and um, again, it's a lengthy process, but the result allows us to have a great um, employee retention, uh, which is an important piece of the of the relationship and a, an important piece. Um, if these students are going to be in a multi-year program, we want to make sure that they have the same success coach um, to work with them over time. And speaking of the success coach, if we move to the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about that role. Um, again, one of our, our key roles focused around retention is that success coach or student um, success coordinator. We like to describe it as sort of a concierge for students um, and for faculty, that one person to call so that a student um, an online student isn't having to navigate a complex phone tree um, at the campus or try to figure out who they need to talk to or be passed to multiple people. Um, our goal is to be the first line of defense to take that call. Um, and if we don't have the answer, we know where to find the answer and where to direct the student. Um, and that um, that success coach role is really proactively focused. We don't want to wait until the student has a problem or an issue or a concern to start to try to build a relationship with them. We make welcome calls, you know, first week of school to introduce ourselves, um, to talk about our role and to to answer any questions or concerns. And we really start building that relationship from day one. So that when a student is in distress or has a question or concern, they know exactly who to call and that's a, a sort of known resource for them. Um, and again, our, our team of student success coordinators use data from our CRM, which is Salesforce, and our uh, data analytics platform, which is we're going to talk more about in a moment, to enhance the student experience. Um, there's a reason that I've talked about the people before getting into the technology, because the technology is a tool. It can't replace the people. The people use the technology to enhance the student experience, but it really does come down to finding the right people and building those relationships. Um, but we do want to talk about the technology because it's a pretty uh, cool technology and we've made a significant investment. So we'll go to the next slide, behavioral analytics, which hopefully um, is something you want to talk about today because it's one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, behavioral analytics is a revolutionary call recording and analytics system, right? It collects all sorts of student interaction data. Um, it helps us to understand the student and it helps us to improve the student experience. And at Wiley, we use behavioral analytics a couple of different ways. First and foremost, it is a call recording platform and that's a quality assurance tool that's helpful. If you've worked with students long enough, um, you might know that sometimes um, students hear what they want to hear out of a conversation. So if there's ever a question about what our Wiley team member has said to a student, we're able to play back that interaction. So if someone calls Polly and says, well, my 
uh, success coach told me that it was free and there was no homework and I would get a puppy as part of the program, we're able to play that interaction back and, and hear what actually happened. Um, behavioral analytics is also a really dynamic coaching tool for us. Um, we've had recorded calls here at Wiley for years, but if you only listen to a single interaction, it's hard to really give meaningful coaching. You become sort of like a Monday morning quarterback telling, you know, you're a colleague that maybe you should have said this differently or explained this in a different way. What um, the behavioral analytics platform does is it allows us to look for patterns in calls across multiple calls, weeks worth of calls, and we're able to look at those those data points and and coach to them. So one of the things that Polly talked about was the importance of engagement in this process. One of the metrics that we actually measure with our behavioral analytics platform is student engagement. How engaged is that student in that interaction? And we're able to give coaching to our colleagues and our employees to improve that engagement score if it's not high enough. Now, I'm not just going to say, Polly, you should have more engaging conversations with students because that's not really effective coaching. What I'm going to do is say, Polly, we're going to work on your engagement score, and I want you to have more engaging conversations by asking these three open-ended questions. That will allow the student to play a bigger role in the conversation and participate more and have better engagement because our data shows us that engagement matters in these conversations. Um, and so it's a coaching tool for our team. Every student facing member of our team is getting regular coaching on their interactions um, and working towards sort of moving the, the metrics to have a better quality call. Um, our behavioral analytics platform is an analytics and reporting dream, right? It's pulling all sorts of data points that we're able to then look at. We have our own in-house data team who can look at those um, those data points and come up with some, um, some likelihood models, some additional data around what our students look like, um, and, and, and that's obviously helpful. It gets to a predictive model. Um, but what I really want to talk about next is, is how we use the behavioral model. So going into the next slide, um, in addition to being a technology that records calls and analyzes calls and runs all sorts of really cool algorithms um, and, and give us all sorts of great data, there's another component as well, and that's the behavioral model. And our team has spent hours and hours and hours of time in a classroom learning this behavioral model. Quite simply, the way that we speak reveals really important cues about who we are and how we process information. And so our team has been trained to linguistically know what to listen to to be able to identify someone's style type. Because while the technology is going to identify the style type as well, it's not going to happen in real time. And so it doesn't help me if I'm working with Polly today and she has a question or an issue for me to wait a half hour from now to see what the system says Polly's style type is. I've got to be as smart as the machine uh, or the robot to be able to know what to listen for to understand who Polly is and how I can help her. So you can kind of see the style types here. Um, and believe it or not, mind blown, not everyone is like you. Not everyone is like me. And so not everyone processes information and reacts to distress in the same way. I know, I couldn't believe it either. So if I'm working with a student who doesn't understand an assignment and is frustrated by a lack of response from faculty, um, first, our team has been trained to know who they are and what their style type is. So I know who I am and I know what to listen for to figure out who you are. And so if I'm working with a student who's in distress over an assignment, my natural style type is to respond with empathy. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. That must be so frustrating. But if the student that I'm trying to help and support is a thoughts person, that means logical, organized, analytical, process oriented, meeting that logical, organized, process-oriented thought student with empathy actually makes their distress worse. All that my thoughts person wants to know is if I'm stuck, what do I do next to get unstuck? And the longer that I take to communicate that information, the worse their distress is. So I need to know if you're a thoughts person to immediately put my natural empathy on the shelf and to provide you with your next step 
or set of steps to start solving your problem. That said, if I'm helping, again, a different student who has the same problem, frustrated with an assignment, um, frustrated with a lack of response from faculty, but this second student is an emotions person, I can't immediately meet my emotions people um, or my emotions style type with their next step. If I immediately try to fix the problem or help them fix the problem, they're going to walk away going, wow, she was cold. and really just didn't seem to understand that I was frustrated. So I need to pull out my empathy for my emotions people and I need to put it on the shelf for my thoughts people. So while we have this great technology, it's also the time that we've spent cultivating um, this behavioral model, understanding what to listen for, to identify someone's style type, to make small modifications to our approach, to have a better overall interaction and a better end result the less time that our, our students are going to be distressed. Um, to Polly's point, if they're not, we might have a, a problem with quality or rigor, right? They're going to be distressed. This is a stressful process, but if we can lessen the time of distress and help them to work through it, they're going to be better prepared um, for the next time they're in distress and we're gonna have better interactions along the way. If they spend a ton of time distressed and worrying through something without seeking support, um, that's when they become a retention risk. And so we wanna have a better overall uh, communication, dialogue, interaction, relationship with students. And uh, our platform to do that is the behavioral analytics platform in, the, in this behavioral model. Um, it also helps us as we uh, to know what how we can help students be successful in a course. I think through my example of my thoughts, people who are logical, organized, process oriented, these are the folks you can give a checklist to and they will bring it back perfectly executed. Um, there are other style types like my own. I'm a reactions person, spontaneous, creative, playful, we can look at a checklist and feel overwhelmed or lose it. And so those are the folks that we like to give small assignments to, deadlines, reminders, to help them be successful. If we go to the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about behavioral analytics at scale. So um, we have been using uh, behavioral analytics for a while here at Wiley, and so we've recorded about 3.5 million interactions. Um, all specific to higher education, because that's what we do here. Um, and so we have a lot of really valuable data. Um, we have some performance dashboards, some coaching, coaching insights. I mentioned some of the predictive insights and the likelihood models um, that we've used. But um, by having that volume of calls recorded, we're really able to learn a lot about student distress and, and how we can use this tool as, as a driver for, for both recruitment and retention. And I think that gets us to time for questions. Great, thank you. If you have any questions, be sure to enter them into the question box. We have a handful that I'll have Kelvin jump into now. But as questions come up, do enter them there. If we don't get to them all today, we'll be sure to pull them out and share them with the presenters and provide written responses. So go ahead, Kelvin. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Great, uh, great presentation. It, um, it actually, uh, given my background in clinical psychology and my strong interest in online learning, uh, this presentation uh, really uh, made me happy for a lot of different reasons, uh, especially getting, uh, especially the conversations that you had around um, just, you know, making sure that everyone who's involved in online learning is in the room, uh, independent of anything else that you do. I mean, that's more than half the battle in proving communication process processes you know within an institution we do have lots of questions so I'll, I'll get right into those um, uh, Daryl uh, Tyler wanted to know in your term to term retention uh, what is your cohort in the term let Polly take that yeah yes in the term to term co retention what is the cohort so so we have we have all of the folks in a program in a given term. So for, um, we'll use PPT, DPT, uh, there, might be, there might be 200, 300 students in that program. So for all of the students that have, were enrolled in, um, we'll say summer D2, which is the second half of the summer term, term, those that come back in the fall would be counted in that, would be counted in that rate. 
Whereas cohort retention, we would track just a cohort. So the students that came in in the fall of 2018 versus the students that came in in the spring of 2016. Um, does that answer the question? So it's all the students enrolled in courses in that program. Okay, thanks, Polly. Um, we also have a, another question, Polly, that hopefully you can address. Um, Andrea Gregg wanted to know, how have your overall graduation rates for programs changed over time? Also, the, the overall graduation rates, and I don't have that data in hand, but they have certainly gone up um, it, at the same rate as the retention has gone up. So students are not only being retained term over term, but they're actually staying and completing the program. I will add to that that some students, I talked a little bit about that strategic portfolio development. So some students might finish in a program that they didn't start in. So they may switch from one program to, to another over the course of their, um, of their stay at Utica College. But they are graduating from the institution. Okay, thanks for that. And we also have, a, a quite, uh, again, lots of questions here. But another one that came up has to do with um, your decision at Utica to centralize uh, student support. Um, so uh, Amelia Bone wanted to know, uh, when you standardized and centralized the support of the online programs from an academic standpoint, what framework guided your administrative choices for roles? Uh, were, they, um, were there outside consultants involved or did you follow a particular model? Um, and I know you've already kind of talked about how Wiley success coaches helped but maybe you could, uh, you know, again, address um, the decision to have a balanced approach where you leveraged Wiley for some of that support versus uh, perhaps doing some things more in-house. Hmm. Yeah, certainly. So we didn't use a model per se. Um, what we did do, though, was we went out and we did some exploring of other institutions that were like us, but had either had or, or were growing online um, portfolios. And we went and we talked to, I think it was, I can't remember what, what year we did the listening tour, but we did a listening tour where uh, many of us, several of us, and I was faculty then, went and took a look at different models that other colleges were using. And that's kind of how we decided that um, you, you can't be an expert in, in everything. And the folks on campus are, are focused on the students that are on campus. And so we thought that, that we should Given where we were with retention, we wanted to, to at least explore another model, and that's when we decided to use um, Wiley as our partner. So if, if it's using the success coaches from Wiley rather than success coaches here on campus, and, and I will agree with Stephanie, most of the students think that those success coaches are right here on campus. And even when I go down to the Orlando office to visit folks, it's all UC. They all have UC gear on. They all have UC emails. I mean, it's the students don't know that those those folks aren't sitting here on campus. So, um, but we decided to let folks be experts where they were experts. And what we're good at here on campus is dealing with, you know, students who start here as first time freshmen or come here um, directly out of uh, high school via um, a community college or some other some other type of institution. So, you know, that's basically what led that. We figured we had tried it and. That's not where we were the experts, and so we outsourced for that. Um, this, in, with instructional design, the decision went a little bit differently. We did have some in-house instructional design to begin with, and we were running our own LMS, so that's one of the things I didn't talk about. And we made a decision that, um, again, we needed those staff folks to focus on um, what was going on on ground, and we could easily um, use other folks to help us with that, that type of work for our online programs, because we were developing too fast, too many, it was too many different areas of study when you um, for the instructional designers. And then we backtracked two, three years into that and decided that we did need additional online support in-house and we needed a balance. Um, so essentially two teams and the, the Wiley instructional design team does certain work for us and then other work we do with the in-house team. So we kind of had the, the model has evolved over time. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another uh, question we had uh, that came in, and maybe, Polly, you, you've covered this, but could you um, describe, this is from Rob Nyland, uh, for the purpose of behavioral analytics, how do you measure student engagement? And, and is it just focused on students, um, or um, are you also looking at the engagements of instructors? So... 
Do you want go me ahead, to take Steph. that, Polly? Yep. So you can so, go ahead and take that one. So as it relates to the behavioral analytics platform, um, it's measuring phone conversations with students. Um, that said, there's different ways that we can also measure engagement in the courses themselves, but this is really measuring how engaged the student was as part of the conversation, whether that's an initial conversation, helping them with program selection or from like a student recruiting standpoint, or whether that's a, a conversation where the student is distressed or having a problem in the program. Um, we want to make sure that there's not a spot in time where we're talking at the student. We want to make sure that we're balancing that conversation to allow the student time to be engaged with us. Mm -hmm. And maybe as a, a quick follow up uh, related to what you just mentioned, Stephanie, um, uh, are you also looking at um, other data in conjunction with the behavioral analytics that you are already tracking? So I'm thinking about the any data within the LMS, so students who might go MIA in a class, you know, they haven't logged on for a couple of weeks, or maybe they're only accessing um, a small portion of the content in a course. Is that data looked at in, in the context of those phone conversations uh, that you're having? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're looking at data in the LMS. We're looking at activity data in our CRM. When was the last time we proactively reached out to these students? When was the last time we talked to them? If they're out on an LOA, what's the plan to get them back in class and, and re-registered for the next term? So we're looking at the behavioral analytics data, the LMS data, the CRM data, and any data we can get our hands on, quite frankly. Yeah, and okay, if, okay. I might, if I might, Kelvin, just follow up on that. Um, we actually use that LMS data, the login data. So once a week, the success coaches respond to login reports. So if a very, this is very specific, but this is one of the ways that the LMS data is used. And if a student has not logged into their course, that success coach will reach out to them and will communicate whatever it is the program director has asked them to do if a student is not logged in for a week. So that varies by program. We let the, the program directors certainly take take charge there. So, but that also serves as our institutional reporting. So we don't have mandatory attendance on campus, but we do have to track attendance at certain points in time because of um, SFS uh, DOE rules. So um, that's student financial services, sorry about that, and Department of Education. So we have to, um, we have to track that on a regular basis and we use the LMS logins for attendance. Um, and we actually have almost uh, 400 of our courses on ground also use the learning management system as a companion to their ground course. And they have weekly assignments due, uh, whether it's a discussion or a quiz or something. And they, that's how they track their attendance too. So we kind of use that technology to, for external reporting purposes as well. No, that's that's great to hear, Polly. And uh, maybe off channel, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick your brain a little bit more <laughs> to to find out how that's all you know managed. Um, but no, that that uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, yep. Andrea Andrea Gregg also um, had a really interesting question. Her question is how how much of the retention success would you attribute to behavioral analytics? Um, to the behavioral analytics program compared to the other changes that um, that you made or that your institution made, such as you know restructuring um, roles, improving instructional design of your online courses using Quality Matters. Um, I'm not sure if you have a sense of that yet, but um, so so I'll take a stab at this, and then I'll let Stephanie speak to. She might have normed data that goes beyond Utica College that might be able to answer that. But I can I can tell you that I think it's an it's a it's a combination. It's it's the dynamics that it creates and the engagement that it creates across all pieces of the of the current strategies that we have in place. And and I'm not confident enough in any that any one of them is not doing, not playing a role to actually be able to test that. So I'm not going to say, well, next semester, let's not do this <laughs> and pull it out of the pull it out of the puzzle. Um, but I can tell you that it, it's, it's about those relationships and that and that engagement of the student and it and it happens over time. Um, I can tell you, I can also tell you that the success coach is is essential to the whole process. And they're the ones using a lot of this information that's been collected through the behavioral analytics tool. But um, when a success coach here and there, a success coach will change. So they'll get promoted or they'll get a better opportunity someplace else or something and they'll change. And the students will complain about that more than they will complain about just about anything else. Okay, no, yeah, thank and you. I, 
Yeah, the, the one thing that I would add as well is that um, we have seen meaningful increases in um, application, so lead to app conversions since implementing behavioral analytics um, across the board with the schools that we work with. So it's a very powerful tool for um, student recruitment, but it's also a really powerful tool for retention because, as I mentioned, the, the better we can do at responding to students in distress, the less time they spend spend in distress, and we know that distress um, is tied to poor retention rate or excessive distress. So um, I think it's, it's the whole picture. It's the people, the process, and the technology all working together in true partnership with shared goals. Okay, no, th th thank you for sharing that. Again, your, 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 your methods are, are, are very interesting in, in, the, in the sense that collectively they're very proactive, which I think, again, really, really helps um, us have a better sense of, of what's going on with our students. Um, and speaking of our students, uh, Andrea DeSantis had a really good question about, um, you know, maybe around um, student uh, privacy issues, but do students realize how their data and phone calls are being used? Sure, so we disclose at the beginning of every phone call that it's a recorded line, so that they understand that, um, that they are on a recorded line. Um, and, and so I, I don't know that, that that's an issue. And then the, the, the in terms of the data that we're looking for is more behavior and calls. It's not tied to their name, their motivation, their you know, discrete concern or distress point. It's more looking at how many minutes in distress was this person on this phone call. Um, so I don't know that there's an, a privacy issue because their name is not tied to it. The specifics of what was distressing them isn't tied to the data. It's more just, is the behavioral analytics platform picking up that they were in distress and what does that look like? Or picking up that they were engaged and how long were they engaged? Mm -hmm. No, that's, does that that's answer your question? Yeah, ho hopefully it does. Um, <laughs> um, but no, I, I think that's, I think that's, a, you know, I know data concerns are, uh, student privacy issues are, are a big concern for all of us. And so, no, it's great that students know up front um, that they're being recorded um, during those phone calls. Um, and it looks like a couple of our questions uh, are related to that topic. So I'm going to uh, switch back to the student success coaching. Um, uh, uh, Lessa Demenhoff, and I, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your last name, but she wanted to find out, um, you know, making that distinction between academic advising and student success coaching. So what are some key differences? Because, you know, she's kind of asking the question, which is a good one. Well, if we're already doing student advising, what, you know, why should we, you know, do something like, you know, using a success coach? Um, so maybe both of you can maybe address that. So, so that's a great question. Um, and I, and it's something that we talk about um, often on campus, especially as we're instituting um, navigators or student navigators on the ground campus. It's more seems to be more of an issue. Um, but there, so all students not only have a success coach, but they do have an academic advisor. And I don't know what system you use to, to keep your your um, student data, but we use Banner. And so there's nothing that happens that those those that information is tracked. Um, by also by an academic advisor as well as a success coach and a success coach is really more about um, navigating the institutional system I think Stephanie talked about that but they do it in a way that it's that it that it builds a relationship it's not transactional per se um, whereas a, an academic advisor is going to provide student with information about careers and about what course should I take next and I'm really having difficulty with this professor or you know those types of things that it that a typical academic advisor would talk to a student about. And a success coach might have and be able to answer simple questions like that for a student, but only if the program director or whoever their primary contact on campus is says, okay, you've emailed me the same question eight times this week. Here's my answer and that will be my answer. <laughs> and so you can just feel free to say, I spoke with the program director and this is what she said, or I spoke with your advisor and this is what she said. So the turnaround time for information is essential for these online students. They, if, if I don't know if you've ever taken an online class, but if, if you're doing your online work at 2 a.m. and you have a question, you really want that answer by 2.15. Uh -huh. And so um, we find that even when they're reaching out to success coaches, they don't wanna wait until the end of the day to get an answer. So the more answers they can provide, the better. 
but they definitely, there is a line between what the success coach, the content that a success coach will provide without interfacing with a faculty member or program director. So, so they do not step in or on the toes of an academic advisor in any way. Mm -hmm. and, and could Polly, could you um, maybe uh, tell us a little bit more about what the caseload typically looks like for your success coaches versus your academic advisors, um, just to get a sense of, you know, how you're managing that uh, by students? Um, so, Stephanie, I don't know if you can help me out with that. I'm not sure how many students a success coach has. I, I would say 100 to 200, maybe but I'm not sure there. And an academic advisor, it depends on the program and how that department decides to, to divide up their advisees. So in smaller programs, the program director is the academic advisor for the online space. So it's not set up the same, same way as it is in a typical ground situation. Um, you know, so, so I don't wanna speak for individual departments, but in Banner, it is always the success coach and the program director. Uh -huh. And how they divide up the load beyond that, I that I have to stay out of the weeds of the, how the departments function. <laughs> That's up to them. <laughs> well, this is Megan. I just want to jump in and say this was a wonderful presentation. We had far more questions than we could get through today, and I'll be pulling those out, sharing those with the presenters, and sending written responses back to you all that participated today. So, again, you can access the live, rec or excuse me, the recording with captions, Tomorrow on our website, I'll also be sending you a link to the recording. You can visit the website for previous webcasts. And I just want to thank the organizations that support the work here at WCET, including these supporting members and our WCET annual sponsors. So thank you so much for spending part of your day with us. And we look forward to seeing you on the next WCET webcast. Thank you to Kelvin. Polly and Stephanie. Wonderful presentation. Bye all.